In this video, we're going to talk a little bit more about the general idea behind... <laughs> I've got a lot of variables that I might use as explanatory variables. How in the world can I choose the right ones? And so, talking about model specification, but in, more in particular, variable selection. Now, model specification also has to do with the functional form, but we talked about that a lot in the first two sets of videos on modeling with lines and modeling with curves. So I'm not going to rehash that much here. But with variable selection, this is something that really gives people fits. How do you, what's the right way to select the variables? I'm sorry to tell you that there is no right way. <clears throat> and anybody that tells you that there is a right way is probably selling something. Um, now, I'm going to give you some information about a lot of ways that people do it, and I just want to try to convince you that there are good things and bad things about all methods. Now, I will tell you about the way I approach modeling, but it certainly has its problems too, so I'm not dry, trying to convince you that there's only one right way. There are several good ways, uh, but there is no universal agreement among economists, or uh, there's certainly a lot more disagreement between economists and statisticians as to the right way. And within different business disciplines, marketing, management, accounting, they'll all have their favorite ways of doing things. So try to get over the, the idea that there is a right way. That does not mean that there are not wrong ways. There are some ways that are clearly bad, and I'll talk about some of those. Now first let me uh, tell you about a couple of people that have their followers, and rightly so. These are both really smart guys. Uh, Ed Lemer, in 1978, wrote a book called Specification Searches. And Ed Lemer, very smart guy, does a lot of commentary on this kind of uh, idea about how people do econometrics and some of the wrong things that people do. But in this book, he said that the right way to choose the variables and the functional form depends on what your goal is. And he lists different goals that somebody might have as uh, you want to do a hypothesis test to see if a particular variable is important. That's one approach. Another approach might be to take a lot of potential variables and weed it down into a simple model. Sometimes people will call that a parsimonious model. Parsimonious means stingy. You want the simplest model. You don't want to throw a lot of variables in there at once. And so he says, depending on your goal, that depends on the method. Uh, and so he comes up with several different ways to approach adding variables depending on what your goal is, although all of his approaches are fairly similar, even though the goals may be different, and I think there's there's some wisdom in that. Now, David Hendry, uh, there are a lot of people that follow Hendry's approach, and Hendry basically says, start from some theories and then formulate the simplest models you can, these parsimonious models, and then estimate the equations and then see if the assumptions of the Gauss-Markov theorem are true. See if there is no heteroscedasticity. See if there's no uh, serial correlation. Um, see if multicollinearity appears to be a problem. And then go back to the beginning and see if you need to add some data and then retest these assumptions of the Gauss-Markov theorem. And by doing this iterative approach, then maybe you can come up with the right model or a good model. And it's okay. There's a lot of wisdom in David Hendry's approach, but a lot of people have pointed out a lot of criticisms of these models. So I want you to just get over the, the idea that there is a correct model that we can discover. What we can try to do is use the data we have use our knowledge of econometrics to the best of our abilities and try not to do something that's horribly wrong. But you have to get over the the idea that there is one right 
model that we can definitely prove is right. Um, but there are some approaches that are good and some that are bad. Now let me share with you some approaches that are bad and then I'll show you the way I approach things here. So many wrong ways and one right way, which I call my way, to select variables. Now let me say one more time loudly and clearly, my way is not absolutely 100% correct. There are problems with my way. I, I say that loudly and clearly, but I'm just going to tell you my way and why I think it's good, and people can teach you their way. But how people do things just depends on how they were trained and the opinion of the people that trained them, really. Um, let me go through a couple of ways that I don't like. Uh, I don't like data, data mining. Um, data mining does have its uses. For me and the kind of work I do, I don't like it. Uh, to me, data mining is when you have a lot of data and you take the human element out of the modeling. Two common methods of doing this data mining approach are called the forward method and the backward method. Now, in the forward method, you have a hundred potential variables, perhaps. You tell the computer, there are little programs that do this. You don't do this. Get the computer to do this if you're going to do it. And the computer will run a hundred regressions, one with each of the 100 variables as one deep in, one explanatory variable. And then it'll pick the one variable that makes, say, the adjusted R squared go up the most. And then it'll go through and pick a second variable, and a third, and a fourth. And it'll keep picking one variable at a time that makes the adjusted R squared go up the most. And then it stops when adjusted R squared is as big as it can be. That's the forward method. Now the backward method is to start with all 100 variables, throw them all in, and then drop the one variable at a time. Automatically the computer searches through and drop the one variable that reduces the, well, I guess increases the adjusted R squared the most again. And you stop when adjusted R squared is as big as it can be. The problem is these two methods give different answers. There are a few problems here. But which of these is right? Well, neither is right. There are problems with both of these. Because all you're doing when you make uh, try to maximize adjusted R squared, you just have to realize if you add a variable and adjusted R squared goes up, all it means is that its t statistic is bigger than 1. If the adjusted R squared goes down, it just means that the t statistic is less than 1. Now, the t statistic could be less than 1 for two reasons. One, the variable is not important, or the true slope is small, right? The true slope is close to zero. The t statistic could also be less than one because the standard error is high. The standard error could be high for a few reasons, but one of the most important is due to multicollinearity. It doesn't mean the variable is not important. It just means that the t statistic is less than one. So if you drop that variable, you are likely to cause omitted variable bias. Don't drop a variable just because its t-stat's less than 1, and don't keep it just only because it's greater than 1. So the problems with that method, it takes the brain out of the process. It takes your knowledge of the subject out of the process. It also ignores the fact that r squared might not go up because of multicollinearity, and dropping that variable will bias your results. So. I don't like these forward and backward methods. Now there are other variants that instead of using adjusted R squared, we'll use things called the AIC or the BIC or other things that are related to R squared. I, I don't like any of them. Uh, another just plain wrong method is to throw some variables in and drop whatever's not statistically significant. And this is wrong for exactly the same reason. Now, my approach, and a lot of people subscribe to this approach, is called the kitchen sink approach. So the kitchen sink approach is to say, let's list all the variables that are necessary. The variables that are obvious, make sense from theory, or are just plain common sense. Then add some other necessary variables. These have to be in there, and you don't drop them for any reason. Some variables that might have been found to be important or statistically significant in literature and research done by others. Those are necessary variables. You have to keep them no matter what. 
Now there are some other variables that you can add that are optional. These variables you can drop if you want later. Optional variables could be something that's interesting. You just want to see if it see what happens. Maybe a hook variable. A hook variable is what I call a variable that's interesting to, to make somebody want to read your paper. You could add a squared term or a cubed term just to check your functional form. Those are optional. Just throw in a variable for fun because maybe it won't hurt. Those are optional. So what you should do in my view is add the necessary variables and don't drop them for any reason. But the optional variables, you can run the regression and then drop them if they're not statistically significant because they're optional by definition, right? So if they're not statistically significant, drop them. But you want to check to make sure that when you drop them, the slopes of the other variables don't change a lot. That might be an indicator of bias.